Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. I'm Henry. I'm Danny. I'm Kagan. We're three leftist veterans that aim to expose the reality of the U.S. military's multiple wars abroad and to illuminate the damage military service does to Americans. American presidents throughout U.S. history have used American military and diplomatic power to force regime change of democratically elected governments around the world. Most veterans come from families vested in prior service, and American generals choose their own, ensuring diversity of thought never interferes with American warmongering. How can we stand by and do nothing while our military kills and destroys lives the world over, while telling Americans that all this death and destruction protects them from terrorists when nothing could be more false? Fortress on a Hill aims to change that. Oh, I, I just want to say one more thing about, you know, Henry, I appreciate the fact that you, um, that you called out the fact that Danny and I are going, um, I, I want to say, like, we shouldn't feel bad about people that can't physically be there. Like, there's a lot of reasons why people can't physically be there. And that's fine. You know, it's just like the the people who want to support then donate money to bail funds donate money to the aclu donate money to you know the people that are the groups that are organizing the events you know like there's plenty of ways for people to get involved without actually physically being there i appreciate that brother thank you and and you're right it's that that, that even if you can't march even if you can't um you know, be on social media a whole bunch. There are steps that people can take, and please take them. Please uh, find an organization that supports Black Lives Matter, that supports the fight against police brutality, and talk to people there. Donate money to them. Um, it's it's you know that they're we're, we're finally starting to see the cracks in the system here a little bit. Like I said, this this is a moment to keep fighting and and keep pushing. So. Um, I had one thought that I wanted to cover real quick, and it, it had to do with a little bit what you were saying, Danny, about um, that there's a there's certainly a strong, always has been a strong presence on the right in terms of supporting police brutality, calling it other things, but it's important that we call out the, um, the weakness, the uh, apathy of ordinary mainstream liberals. Um, I found this morning a note I added just before we started that uh, there was a leaked 2015 memo written by senior House Democrats who advised their party members not to show public supports for Black Lives Matter. This was in 2015 during Barack Obama's time in office. Why was it that the first black man in office really did nothing for black Americans, especially regarding police brutality? So we have to look in two directions. One is we have vi violent people who believe um, protests need to be put down. And on the other side, we have hapless politicians who have no issue or have no compunction about not sticking their neck out for the people they actually represent. Sorry. Yeah. That, Go ahead, Danny. No, that's, that's, that's an important point. I mean, Malcolm X talked about the threat of white liberals, you know? Um, he said like, you know, there are many whites, I'm quoting him, there are many whites who are trying to solve the problem, but you know, uh, but you never see them going under the label of liberals, you know, in other words, you know, he sees them as dangerous and that the, the true like accompanying allied whites you know, go beyond polite, liberal, democratic party politics. And, uh, you know, uh, he said the white liberal differs from the white conservative in one way. The liberal is more deceitful and hypocritical than the conservatives. Both want power, but the white liberal has perfected the art of posing as what he called the Negro's friend and benefactor mm -hmm. uh, and using them as sort of political pawns. He called them a political football, you know, and that white liberals control the ball through tricks tokenism and false promises of integration and you mentioned obama and obviously he would be pre preferable to trump when it comes to de-escalating the situation and maybe even attempting to unify america but let's not forget that like you know obama's response to garner and like race relations and police brutality in the cities was largely 
you know, rhetorical and then like having a beer session between like the black professor who had the cops called mm-hmm. on him or whatever. I mean, it, it was just so like such a veneer of like politeness rather than tangible action. And of course he would argue and so would his like uh, favorite defenders on Pod Save America, you know, or whatever, who everyone just loves. But like they would all defend him and say, well, you don't understand the political constraints he was under we couldn't alienate white america with the first black president and there's always like there's always like ethical hedges and excuses mm-hmm. and justifications you come up with but uh yeah no i think you bring up an important point um so uh henry do you what are your thoughts on the general uh actual militarization of the conflict uh and the crisis through you know the guard and 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 some of the other stuff we've seen um i it seems way too uh, too much of a reflexive action on the part of us to um, for certain governors to be willing for their national guard troops to go where they're requested. Um, there, have, I can't think of the states off the top of my head right now, but there have been a few states that did decline to send troops to Washington D.C., but the vast majority of them did, including states that surround D.C., uh, Maryland, West Virginia, a couple other places. Um, what process exists in any state government to discuss how its National Guard is being used? Um, you know, the governor, like we, what we've seen with what's happened with the coronavirus, is that the governor gets sometimes gets added into the actual chain of command because the governor commands... Um, it's National Guard. And so like the point I made earlier about the D.C. National Guard, there seems to be, well, why is the D.C. National Guard not just considered active duty? I mean, well, not not active duty in, in the time, not the time they work, but federalized. Why aren't they just always federalized troops if the president can snap his fingers and say, these troops are going to be here in D.C.? It's not a military operation. There's no you know, I mean, they, they, Trump might call out enemies, but legally speaking, there's they can't do that kind of stuff. So why is it is it such a, a push the button response? And I, I know the answer. It's just that we like I talked about with Fortress Washington, D.C. earlier, that when somebody pushes the panic button, as Trump likes to, whether whether it's necessary or not, that other states, other governors, other leaders respond and they they want to help. But. In this particular instance, and again, I, I, I haven't seen any video of National Guard guys or military guys really getting into it with protesters. There probably is some um, just because of their, their large numbers and how bad the, the, the last week, last 10 days um, have been in terms of the kind of violence they've been causing. I do think it's important we talk about what happened in Lafayette Park and about seeing the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in his battle duty uniform walking with law enforcement and other professionals because, and Danny, please chime in on this anywhere. The chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff is the senior military advisor to the president. They do not exist in the chain of command. So when all this stuff started, Trump immediately said he wanted General Milley to be in charge of the response. He wanted him to take over obvious uh, militarism push for Trump. But the problem is, is that Milley is not part of the actual military chain of command right now. However, that didn't fucking stop him from going with him to this park to being out in his, you know, and, and the comments that he's made um, along with Esper's comments about the battles, uh, excuse me, battle space, which is just a misnomer for area where we're going to go try to kill people. But that's, you know, that, that, if everything uh, looks like a nail, you're going to use your hammer. And that's exactly what, what's happening with all this. Of course, after the horrible treatment of the peaceful protesters in Lafayette Park, both of them immediately backspinned away from all of this, not taking any responsibility for their part, except to say they won't go testify to the House Armed Services Committee about their role in that violence. So they're totally happy to do it. But they won't talk about it in 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 a in a congressional hearing atmosphere to let the American people actually get some information about what actually happened. So we're seeing huge amounts of military power of of military you know uh, foot power foot soldiers um, 
and demonstrations, you know, shows of force. Danny, you know how much the Army fucking loves that phrase, show of force. Those guys standing on the, the Lincoln Memorial, you know, this whole, you know, you almost that, that's Fortress Washington. When I say that, I think that image. And that's the reality. That's how it was when I was there. I lived there for five months in 2003. I literally worked at the Pentagon and checked IDs. And I was very much part of that law enforcement apparatus that was there in D.C. And it's terrifying to think about now. Um, But I'm uplifted to hear that most of the National Guard troops in the D.C. area are going back to their states. I need to do a little more digging on that because I want to confirm outside the mainstream media. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm aboard. I'm aboard with the, the leadership choices, with calling or the, the threat of active duty troops from the president when it hadn't even been that long and the threat to send the American military to violate their state sovereignty and their choices to deal with the protesters in the way that they see fit. I'm not saying they should use violence or not, but I am saying that state versus federal authority should have a solid wall between it. And I think, I think that's it. No, I'm, I'm so glad you brought up Mattis and Asper who should both immediately resign. Um, not no. only uh, uh, Millie, I'm sorry. Yeah. Mattis, uh, he should have resigned over Yemen, but anyway, he didn't, he, you know, he resigned uh, because, you know, Trump even hinted at pulling out of Afghanistan and Syria. But I digress from St. Mattis's character. Anyway, I am glad that he spoke out, by the way. Uh, Millie and Esper should immediately resign. Uh, Esper, simply because I hate him. No, I'm just kidding. That, that, that I do. But because of his look to the language, as Christopher Hitchens said, right? Uh, look to the language. He used the term battle space to describe and dominating the battle space. He used these military buzzwords that we all know because that's the language of the institution he runs and that he was sort of raised in before he became a lobbyist uh, for that same industry. On the corporate side, so when you go to the military, don't be surprised, right, when that's the way they talk and the way they think. And, uh, and it was utterly inappropriate, and he should have never really been involved in the conversation in the first place, but he, he ought to still resign for, well, really a million reasons, uh, conflicts of interest with Raytheon being one of them. Millie should resign because allowing himself to walk the grounds with law enforcement uh, and become what I would consider literal fuel on the fire. I mean, a walking accelerant for a raging arson job that was a government arson, not a protester arson. Uh, Really just, it it calls so much into question about his character and morals that like, I couldn't even look that guy in the eye. I already didn't like him, but I mean, it's insane what he let himself become a tool of. And I don't accept his apology and I don't accept his pivot. He needs to go. He was promoted beyond his level of competence. He is a walking Peter principle. And, he doesn't, he, I mean, Trump doesn't understand statute law, which makes him incompetent to be president, but we, we already knew that. But Millie ought to know better. He ought to know and advise, which is his primary role under the Goldwater Nichols Pentagon Reorganization Act of 1986, that as chairman of the Joint Chiefs, he not, not only does he not have a position in the chain of command and contr- actually commands nothing, but his role is to provide sound military uh, and in some sense constitutional advice to the president. And uh, he should have known, like, listen, putting me out on the street or even saying publicly, do you want me to lead the response is like utterly inappropriate. And if you continue to do it, I'm going to have to resign. You know, but he's a company man. He's a company man. He's a mid-level manager masquerading as a strategic leader. And that's what we usually get at the top because those are the folks we promote are company men, not principled men. So this was really, really dangerous. Um, you mentioned Fortress DC. What we're seeing exposed on a rather tangential, but I think also important level is that like DC is a, is, is a federal military occupied state to begin with. I mean, the, the nature of the way it's organized in our constitution with like taxation without representation and stuff, you, we're seeing a lot of that exposed. I mean, DC is, is kind of a federal mandate uh, and it's very unquestionable where it fits into our supposed federalist system, right? So DC has always been problematic and it's no, it's no accident that that that's where we saw a lot of this nonsense and some of the most uh, militarization on the behalf of the federal government. And uh, yeah, my final point on this is uh, 
Trump bashing is so easy that it's lost a lot of its uh, fun for me. Um, but also it's lost a lot of like its value. Uh, Jimmy Dore talks all the time about how it's beating up on the use, you know, the uh, village idiot. But there are moments when leadership, even executive leadership is vital. And Trump's unfitness from a character and competence perspective is on display perhaps more than it's ever been as if we needed more evidence. Um, you guys uh, know, even as NCOs, we were always told and officers too, of course, to be careful what you say around your soldiers, because you're setting an example and a precedent, whether you mean to or not, just by dint of your sort of rank and position, however modest. And this is the leader of the federal government and the commander in chief of the armed forces. And he has proved to be nothing less than, again, a catalyst for violence, a side taker, the wrong side an escalator of violence through his leadership by tweet, which is sort of a wonderful hybrid of like the Orwellian and Huxley not, you know, dystopia that we're living in. Uh, what I think I'll finish on is that something that I think the generals have, and we'll talk about the Senate next, but something I think the generals have, the retired generals have pointed out correctly, even though I'm a little bit skeptical of the messenger is that Trump is reflexively militaristic and heavy handed and doesn't understand again statute law in the sense that he has set such a low threshold for what constitutes an insurrection under the insurrection act of 1807 which is what he would uh, presumably use to pull out potentially active duty troops which he uh, reportedly seriously considered on a number of occasions and offered publicly uh you know that 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 law was written vaguely you know, on purpose. But most presidents have shown some sort of caution, right, with it. And he has set the threshold so low for what constitutes an actual insurrection that it's obscene, uh, just as a point of historical comparison and not what aboutism, but genuine historical comparison. More folks, more people, including uh, at least one police officer, were killed in uh, four days of rioting in Newark in 1967, one city, one riot, four days, then have died in the national protest for two weeks now. If this constitutes an insurrection, then anything constitutes an insurrection. And the precedent that's set is one of a genuine uh, paramilitary or actual military police state. So, you know, uh, final thing, uh, I said that already, but Trump is informed and motivated it seems clear primarily by his deep masculine insecurity and and those masculine patriarchal whatever you want to call them insecurities at the root of his character have informed his tough guy posture throughout his life and when all that meant was and it was still bad but when when all that meant was that a billionaire had enough money to buy out an entire page in the new york times in the late 80s to call for the execution immediately without trial, essentially, of the innocent Central Park Five, then you could almost say, well, it's just a private citizen doing it. But when he's president of the United States and ostensible leader of the free world, uh, we truly are in a uh, truly dangerous Orwellian and, and fascist moment. And uh, I've, I've withheld the F word until now, but, uh, but I think that we're there. And that's my general thoughts on the, the military involvement and Trump's leadership role. I like that you brought up uh, Mattis's sort of com uh, statement. I feel like we'd be remiss if we didn't mention it and talk about it a little bit, just because, um, you know, for a lot of my family that was and for like acquaintances who were uh, Trump support or tr yeah, supporting Trump, they were, you know, really into Mattis in the beginning, you know, they bought into his whole warrior monk uh, friggin' persona that he portrayed and stuff. But I think like my favorite part of the of his statement is where he says, Donald Trump is the first president in my lifetime who does not try to unite American people. He does not even pretend to try. Instead, he tries to divide us. We are witnessing the consequences of three years of this deliberate effort. We are witnessing the consequences of three years without mature leadership. We can reunite without him, drawing on the strengths inherent in our civil society. This will not be easy, but as the past few days have shown, 
but we owe it to our fellow citizens to pass generations that bled to defend our promise and to our children. We can come through this trying time stronger with a renewed sense of purpose and respect for one another. And I mean, yeah, that's some nice flowery language. But like that first part where he's talking about Donald Trump, like that is some serious line drawing. And I am really interested to see how a lot of Trump supporters who were big fans of Mattis, like how they try to wrap their heads around and try to contort this like into whatever it is and what they think it is. So, but I think it's great that he, he felt like now was the time to make a statement. And uh, so, I, I mean, w- whether or not that does anything we, is, remains to be seen, but it is nice to say that he actually, you know, he felt like he needed to say something. Yeah, I, I think it's important. And now we're dipping into our kind of, and it's okay, it's good. We're kind of dipping into our last go round on the uh, military descent and part of that. Most of the most, I think the most important part is, is the rank and file dissent, which we'll get to. But from the generals using Mattis as an instructive example, um, I think it is remarkable the United Front, that at least anti Trump front, which is dangerous to make it just about Trump, but the you know, the remarkable United Front of the retired generals, even guys like Dempsey, who have like spoken out in the past and said, you know, you shouldn't speak out as a retired general, even he thought he had to. So, like everybody, even Colin Powell, who's like the perennial latecomer to the game, have jumped in. Uh, but yeah, we have to cost, be, take caution, take heed before we canonize and sanctify these folks. Mm-hmm. Um, Mattis is problematic on a number of levels. Uh, he's right about what he wrote in some ways. Much of what he wrote, if it had a different author, I would have just reflexively agreed with. Um, I think he's overestimating Trump's uh, unique nature. I think Trump is unique and is uniquely bad, but he's not the first guy to n- not try to unite us. Um, yeah, we can't focus on just him without seeing the the system that gave us him. Absolutely. And look, when Mattis, this sudden, you know, peaceful, this, this new peacenik that they're making him out to be, when Mattis <laughs> said that it's a hell of a lot of fun to kill people, publicly said that, was quoted saying that, uh, George W. Bush was president in 2005. And I'm sorry. But if we are going to forgive the sins of Bush and act like he was not a divider in chief himself, whether it was Katrina or the war in Iraq and calling all Democrats essentially like un-American because they were against that war, which was, of course, built on lies. Like then I think we're we're remiss. And I mean, Reagan did the same thing in Central America and on almost every issue in the early 80s when he declared the first war on terror in 1981. Right. Exactly. 30 years before this or 20 years before the second one. So, yeah, I mean, Mattis is a is a is a troubling figure. Um. My final point on him is like, you know, my favorite movie, of course, as everyone has heard, is, you know, Good Will Hunting. It has been since I first saw it in 98. And uh, I remember there's this great line in the beginning when he's kind of sparring intellectually with Robin Williams in a brilliant scene when he first goes into his office, therapist, and he says, uh, he's looking at all his books on the shelves, right? And he's judging them. <laughs> and I do the same thing because, uh, because I'm an arrogant wannabe intellectual. And uh, he says, uh, you fucking people baffle me, he says, uh, in like a soliloquy. He says, uh, surround yourselves with these books. But they're all the wrong books. They're all the wrong fucking books, you know. And uh, my point is that uh, Mattis has, in some ways, self-cultivated, but it's really a media creation, this image of the warrior monk. We always hear about how he's never been married, how he doesn't sleep, how he reads so extensively, and he has this library of thousands of books. And, and that all sounds great, because I'm a library of thousands of books guy myself. But I would submit, uh, I haven't seen his full library, although I've seen his reading lists, his recommended reading lists. And, and by and large, he's reading the wrong books. Okay, so just calling yourself a reader or an intellectual doesn't mean that you're actually going to understand what's really going on because he has misdiagnosed the system forever. And I will say this, I think that while I agree with much of what these generals said, and I'm glad they did speak out because I think we all have to use our platform in a positive way when we can, let's not forget that a, they were late comers to the game. B, they're not particularly vocal on any of the systemic stuff. They're more focused on Trump's individual discrete actions. And C, I can guarantee you that, I can almost guarantee you that none of these guys were out in the streets in any real solidarity. And if anyone wants to say that's because they're too old, I'll point to the man in Buffalo, Gugino, who was 75 years old and shoved and bled from the head by showing solidarity uh, in Buffalo. So, you know, let's just be careful about the canonization. Let's not look to the top for solutions. 
let's not look to the military, even even you and I and Henry for the solutions. Let's 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 go to the grassroots and remember that no major change for justice or rights, liberty, civil or civil, uh, were ever given. They were always taken. And that doesn't necessarily mean violence. It can be a Gandhi-esque way, but it was always taken. And the polite liberals or the government structure has only responded when they felt they had no other choice and they were under massive pressure from the streets, so to speak. So yeah, we got to be careful about the uh, about about these generals and take what they say with some caution, I think. Well, and I mean, the people like, you look at any uh, revolution or rebellion you know, when they're successful is that moment when the the instruments of power, of force, turn with them. You know, like in the Philippines before Duterte and everything, but when they had, uh, you know, it was, it's, it was that moment when the, the police and the military are like, we're not going to fire on these cop, on these protesters. And they and then joined with them. And that's always, that's always the moment, that's the turning point is when the people who are used as the instruments of force by the state become part of the solution. And, and I think like, yeah, like you said, it's, it's going to take those, every, every one of those people who are activated to come to that realization of, wait a minute, like what the hell am I doing? That, that was the thesis of my column this morning on antiwar.com, which I called alone and unafraid, but I, you know, struck through on, you know, because they were alone and afraid. And it's about the security elites and how, you know, like I said in the article, in Kansas City and every other city, we sort of like buck ourselves up as protesters out there by, you know, pronouncing over and over again vocally, you know, we are many, they are few, right? And, and, it, and, and it's, you know, by the merits, strictly it's true, but... Uh, the elites, the oligarchs, the security officials in history, they have always counted on the foot soldiers. In, and that goes from security guards up to, you know, Delta Force uh, running that gamut to do their bidding. And uh, the moment, the reason they're so scared of GI resistance uh, historically, and that's why it's been whitewashed from the tail end of the Vietnam history, the pivotal role that played is because their biggest fear is that they'll just become actually few and not be able to count on those foot soldiers. And so I ended my article today by talking about the uh, flat, what's, what's been labeled, what's been actually titled the flower power picture. But it was repeated uh, thousands of times, even just in the Vietnam protests, whereby the peaceful protester, often a woman, but not always, takes like a daisy and, and walks right up to the National Guard with their bayonets, you know, gleaming in the sun and, and puts the, the daisy in the, uh, in the barrel and the National Guard chooses not to shoot, uh, even though maybe they've said you're not supposed to come that close to them. And so in that moment, that symbolic moment when the, uh, when the, the foot soldiers of the security state refuse in some small way, then the veneer of power shrinks a little. And uh, I think the last thing I want to say about this is, uh, and it's important, and that's why I ended my article with it, is uh, the, fa- the photographer uh, who famously took that one picture that's like just gone viral for uh, half a century, he remembered and said later that he noticed that the National Guardsmen pictured in the photo were shaking, they were trembling, um, because they knew what should I do here? Should I shoot? I don't really want to shoot. They were scared of this little woman, you know, who's still alive and has spoken about it. And, uh, and I think the people that they protect today uh, from Trump all through the, uh, you know, military state, the warfare state are, are themselves trembling even more than those National Guardsmen. And we need to keep that in mind. And that's what makes military dissent and police dissent so very, very valuable. Yeah, I've been uh, I've been really uplifted, uh, Danny, to hear the number of uh, different people that have been reaching out to you, and also the number of people that have been reaching out to other places like the GI uh, GI Rights Hotline and the Center on Consciousness and War, asking about becoming a, a, a conscientious objector, or or if not, at least understanding what their rights are in terms of resisting this. In, in one way or another, and I think that that's a, I think that's a really great sign for what this portends as it as it continues to grow. Is that if if so many people who are currently in uniform are having issue with this, then there are others who are having the same issue but aren't speaking out. They just they keep it to themselves because the military is insular in that way. 
Um, so yeah, I've, I've been so uplifted watching the, uh, the, um, people going to protest, but especially our, our anti-war veteran brothers and sisters, um, helping people organize, uh, keeping, uh, you know, checking on each other when, when people go out to go on, uh, protests make sure everybody got home safe you know ask questions about what you should do in this situation or that situation um that actually reminds me kagan if you if you if you happen to be out and get arrested call me man I, i'll i'll do whatever i can i don't know exactly what that'll be at this moment i do the same for you danny but you're in kansas city so <laughs> i i could i could i could pay you some money i guess oh um, no worries don't worry you won't have to bail me out because i have a feeling that i'll be uh quote uh not trying to escape that'll be the original <laughs> that's, that, that's, 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 a, that's a rare level of self-importance i just exposed <laughs> but I, I think the joke is funny i, I still like it that's such such a fucking outside agitator. Yeah, man. <laughs> Still waiting on my Soros money and my and my motivational call from Putin. Haven't gotten right. either. I'll right, tell you. Right. But um, I think that's about all I have to say for this. I uh, I am both excited and terrified to see what it what it leads to next. But like I said, I think this portends to be a time of real change, and I hope that it that it does turn into that. Uh, let me just, yeah, let me jump in on some of the things that you mentioned and just provide some, like, some flesh, some empirical flesh to these important points you brought up. Um, about face, uh, which has really kind of, like, joined with other major uh, mm -hmm. anti-war veteran organizations like Veterans of Peace, but not only them, in a, in a real show of solidarity, um, has put out this open letter, Stand Down for Black Lives. Uh, as of... Two days ago, we're recording right now on June 9th. As of June 7th, there were 881 veterans who had put their names publicly. And that's important because your name shows up on the letter when anyone else clicks on it. Uh, 881 people have signed it. That's a lot because it is, you know, it is scary to put your name. It's there forever, right? So I'm going to take a screenshot of it, you know, even if they delete it and it's risky. Um, on a anecdotal, but I also think constructive level, which is clearly one of my favorite words, um, I've had... I got to count because I'm going to put it in an article soon, but uh, it's over 70 active duty, active duty military members have reached out to me personally. And that's in nine days or so. Um, that's about as many as have reached out to me in the last two years, because I have gotten these notes about ethical quandaries and folks doubting the wars and thinking about resigning and all these different things and, and, and asking for advice, which again, I, I try not to give um, because it's their risk. But, um, but I do try to talk to them and talk about options to give solidarity. So my point is that I'm inundated with calls and I'm like a nobody. And, and here I am getting over 70 folks who've reached out to me. And now uh, probably half a dozen or, or, or 10 or so of them are former students who obviously I won't name. They're active duty lieutenants, some in combat arms, most in combat arms, some deployed, who are having massive, massive identity crises about not only their unwillingness or discomfort in like suppressing their own people here at home, but also uh, the wars in general and seeing them as a very like interconnected thing. So like, I think that, and, and, and so the other like 65 folks are strangers who just got my email and um, I've never seen anything like that, obviously in my 20 odd years connected to the military now almost. Um, this is profound. The rumblings are real the unity of the general speaking out. I mean, we're seeing something close to a military, uh, at least moral revolt. And, and I don't pretend to know how this ends either, but it's going to be really interesting to see. And it certainly has not happened since the early 1970s. And uh, the fact that it's happening with a volunteer military, which operates largely out of like an economic draft through bonuses, and paying off colleges and a poor economy uh, is even more remarkable because the, the, the draft was gotten rid of and the volunteer force formed actually by Nixon in a very cynical way in order to eliminate 
veteran descent in order to eliminate the protest movement of civilians because they wouldn't be worried about getting drafted and in order to tamp down on some of the rumblings that were happening within the military itself because they were like in the early 70s during the Vietnam War there were these cafes and underground newspapers and there were entire platoons refusing to patrol and then in 551 cases just between 1970 when they started counting and 1972 Two, actually only halfway through 1972, uh, 551 times soldiers rolled grenades, or in other words, fragged was the phrase their officers or NCOs, causing, I think, 86 deaths. It was 86 deaths, in fact. Um, in order to avoid, and I don't support murder, but in order to avoid that in the future, they came up with this volunteer military. So to see 881 signatures so far, it's probably close to 1,000 now, is pretty remarkable. And the last thing I'll say is... Um, about face has uh, nominated and asked me to serve as one of their kind of lead spokesmen on this campaign. And, uh, and there are a lot of other folks as, or more qualified to do that, particularly folks uh, of color, uh, in the organization. And, and I'll just say that, uh, I was flattered and humbled by their choice to ask me. Um, I, I think that it demonstrates some faith in me, but more so the idea that we want to try to reach out to folks who might not otherwise agree with us. And sometimes a relatively clean cut spokesperson uh, might seem like a tactical way to achieve that. But I will say that regardless of whether that was any of the motivation, one of the things that stands out about about face and to a large extent veterans for peace, especially the younger generation of veterans for peace is the intersectional nature of what we do. And it's about solidarity. It's about what the assassinated archbishop and friend of the poor in El Salvador, Oscar Romero, who's recently been sainted by Pope Francis, what he called accompaniment, which is really just a willingness to stand beside, not necessarily try to lead, but try to be a good shepherd. And also, well, shepherds are bad words. That's kind of like leading, but try to be a supporter of the marginalized. And About Face has done that repeatedly, and we're seeing it now. And it's why I always wear my veterans gear out on the street, because what I'm saying is, no, I don't, I'm not trying to make this into an anti-war protest, but what I am trying to do is draw connections between what these people are seeing on the ground and what I've seen overseas, but also to show that those of us who are involved in other seemingly discreet, but not actually uh, movements like anti-war are here for you. We're with you. You know, we're not leading you. I'm not the white messiah out there. I'm, I actually try to step, step back uh, as much as possible as I think we ought to in this moment and reflect on our own blind spots as, as white men. But, you know, accompaniment and solidarity is important. And About Face was at Standing Rock. Like, let's not forget that. About Face and this new, young, post 9 11s anti war veteran movement has been intersectional from the first. It's inspiring, it scares the powers that be. And I will end my point here by saying something is afoot, folks within our military ranks. Something profound is afoot. I don't know where it ends, but I am hopeful about this moment and the solidarity that's been shown. And, uh, and it does go beyond just the lefties. You know, it goes beyond those of us who read Trotsky and it goes to the libertarians in movements like Bring Our Troops Home, who, you know, we don't agree about a lot of things. We may not even agree everything about the protests, but, you know, there is a wide range of veterans who are skeptical of the warfare state. And they, uh, they geographically span from the Mountain West, where that libertarian organization, Bring Our Troops Home, is, you know, kind of situated all the way to, you know, the more far left organizations. And I think we probably fall on the left side. So the point is, this is a broad movement, geographically, physically, and cerebrally, in a certain sense. And uh, I'm just proud to be the smallest part of it. And I think that uh, the pod and, and, and those of us who are in the streets are doing our best to contribute. Yeah, that's my last thought on military descent. It's, it's incredible. It's, 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 I'm so proud. I'm just so, I'm literally, I, some, sometimes I want to cry when I read stuff like posts by Brittany or stuff from About Face. It's great stuff. And I'm glad that you brought up the, fa like, that's so cool. I'm so happy for you, dude. <laughs> that's really great. Um, I, I feel like, you know, the three of us are cis, straight, white dudes, right? And so we, I think we do a good job of acknowledging our privilege. Um, and there's always more to learn. There's always more to uh, acknowledge. And I, I, like, my hope for humanity is that we just get into that space of, especially white people, like, we just get into that space of wanting to learn and then being uncomfortable. Like with, with some of the things that we may hold, you know, and it's, it's not, 
like it's I think it's it's wrong if you learn about something and then are willing it willfully ignorant of it afterwards. If you are willing to just say, Oh, this is a problem, but I it's not it doesn't affect me or I'm not personally involved in this, so what does it matter? And like that's that's the attitude, that apathetic attitude that needs to change. And and I feel like we we try our best here, you know, because we have this platform being veterans, you know, we we try our best to like speak out and I know we, we talk about this all the time, but I I know that we really want to have a person of color on our pod just because it would be nice to have a different perspective. So if there's anybody out there that wants to be like, you know, any female, any people of color, uh, anybody wants to be a part of our pod, like, please don't hesitate to reach out to us to ask. Like, we want to hear other people's voices. So. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, I think, um, Henry, do you have anything before we close out? Um, no, no, no. I think I'm, I think I'm good. Well, let me just, uh, you know, be the insufferable and verbose Leo here and just, you know, kind of close out by saying, um, you know, to quote the great East Coast rapper. And oh, by the way, rap was better before, folks. I'm sorry. It, it stopped. It, it stopped <laughs> mattering in the late 90s. And I'm just empirically correct about that. Uh, you know, to quote Nas, you know, one love to our brothers and sisters who are out there in the anti-war movement and then also in the non-veteran community and um in about face those of us who are like particularly active daily are checking in as you mentioned henry every day on our threads and just showing support and a lot of folks are struggling with the symptomatic kind of flashback and ptsd aspect you know when you get tear gassed by your own government and you're walking around Kansas City or Washington, D.C. or Baltimore and, you know, Kansas City looks like Kandahar and Baltimore looks like Baghdad. It, it, it's, it's bringing up, you know, these people are sacrificing. A lot of our brothers and sisters out there in the anti-war movement who are showing solidarity are really sacrificing uh, because it's very difficult. It brings up a lot of bad memories to uh, be back in a war zone. And that's what it felt like, especially the first weekend. And uh, I just want to say that uh, we really do genuinely love you guys. And uh, if you take nothing else out of this, just like take care of each other, check on each other and be kind. Like it's the simplest thing in the world. Like if I tell my kids that I don't care if you agree with me on everything. I mean, I would love you to be a little like, you know, neo Marxist, but like take care of one another and be kind. It's the simplest thing, whether you ground it in religion and the new Testament or secular sainthood, just be kind to one another, man. These are tough times and we got to watch out. And I'm just so proud of everybody. It's, it's, it's amazing. Thank you. Thanks, guys. The guys and I love doing the podcast. Being able to share our experiences in the military with allies and supporters means the world to us. But we can't do all the work. We need you to share an episode of ours with someone, anyone, whom you might think could be affected by it. A young person looking to join the military or possibly parents advocating for a kid joining the military, conscientious citizens who care about the violence the U.S. wages in their name, advocates for women and people of color who understand the harsh environment the military creates for minorities and inflicts on those same minorities across the globe, and anyone else you think might be affected by it. Please take a moment, share this with them. Now, our podcast is supported in a few different ways. First, there's Patreon, where we're blessed to have an array of wonderful supporters helping the guys and I pay for some of the podcast's expenses. Those who contribute $10 a month or more will be mentioned right here as an honorary producer of the podcast, helping keep you, our listeners, stocked with new episodes. But you don't have to contribute $10 a month to help us. For as little as a dollar a month, you can help keep us going, paying for hosting and storage fees, transcribing old and new episodes, promoting and expanding the podcast, and more I'm sure I can't think of at the moment. So let's bring out these honorary producers, and they are Will Arenz, Fahim Shirazi, Henry Zamoda, Adam Bellows, 
Eric Phillips, Paul Appel, Julie Dupree, Thomas Benson, Emma P., Janet Hansen, Lawrence Taylor, and the Status Quo Podcast. Your contributions are wonderfully helpful to us. Thank you so much. However, if Patreon isn't your style, you can contribute directly to us through PayPal at paypal.me forward slash Fortress on a Hill. Or please check out our store on Spreadshirt.com for some great Fortress merch. And do understand that if you can't afford to contribute to us, that doesn't bother us at all. This is a hard time for everybody, and we just want to make sure that what we share gets to as many people as possible. And now, let's get back to the podcast. Good morning, listeners. Um, Welcome to Fortress on a Hill. We are going to take uh, today to discuss the events of the last few weeks, the brutal murder of the death of, of, uh, excuse me, of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis police and the heavily, heavily militarized police response that we uh, have all seen since it began. Um, So just off the top, I and I, you know, I, I haven't been actively involved in a law enforcement job in five or six years now. And I have to say, watching the news over the last week, I am so, so ashamed of the profession of law enforcement. Um, you know, I, when I first learned and understood about pr- police brutality and the many layers of it, I there was a, a layer there for me because. I, I, I would have resigned. I would have resigned years ago over events like this. And I don't know how anyone who has a mindset of, and I'm just going to use the LAPD slogan here, but it, it is what people need to focus on is protect and serve. Police officers are supposed to do a service to the community um, using brutal violence on protesters, mostly peaceful protesters does not fill that mission. Um, in fact, the, uh, the, the, the one moment that struck me the most since this all began was the, uh, the violent assault of uh, an elderly protester in Buffalo um, that he was just knocked flat on his ass and you could see he was bleeding from the ear. Um, and I wish I could say that the ne- what happened next after the other officers passed him, I wish I could say this next thing gave me a little bit of hope but it's just kind of how they're trained. The first individuals to stop and render aid to this gentleman, I apologize, I don't remember what his name was at the moment. I know he was a, he's a prominent anti-war activist and uh, was involved with the King's Plowshare 7 group. Um, The first people to stop and and help him and attempt to ascertain if he's okay are soldiers. I assume two National Guard, I don't know if they're medics, I don't know if they're MPs, I, I don't really know, but they did. One of them took a knee next to him as the camera panned away and tried to help him. And those are the kind of things I'm talking about. So, so how, how anyone can remain a, a part of a law enforcement organization right now is beyond me. Um, yeah, I'm, I'm just, I'm just, I am. And I, I, I think to myself about the life that I would have would have probably led had uh, my health not gotten really bad, which was the life of an agent at a three letter agency somewhere. Um, but anyway, I think uh, I think I about covered it for this uh, initial yeah. for me. Right. So yeah, the first thing we're doing here is just kind of responding, I think, to all that's happened from our three perspectives and and also those that we've kind of been around and diagnosing this moment is almost impossible but responding to it i think is you know vital and you know henry you mentioned what i thought was just a a terribly indecent moment uh where the 75 year old man in buffalo was shoved to the ground and i think that the the piece you know you mentioned how they walk right by him and and the moment in the video that most struck me in a personal way was when immediately one of the officers did slow down, mm-hmm. look, and appeared to 
want to render aid and his buddy or maybe superior, I don't know, grabs him and like pulls him away. And I, I just thought that that was like the ultimate moment of indecency and an explanation of the group think and the price of loyalty that sort of occurs in any paramilitary uh, organization. And of course, what we now know is just two hours ago, uh, Trump tweeted about that man, Martin Gugino, uh, from Buffalo, the 75 year old man. And he said the following quote, Buffalo protesters shoved by police could be an Antifa provocateur. <laughs> now, you know, we're going to talk more about Trump's response in, you know, our kind of uh, third go round in this round table. But let us be clear that in every single war America has waged at home and abroad against an idea, whether that idea was fascism, communism, and now terror, uh, anyone who becomes a dissident in any way, even peacefully, which he clearly was, this man, uh, will be, will be, not maybe, will be labeled as fascist, communist, or now terrorist. And Antifa is uh, sort of like a new buzzword for terrorism. So we must always reject this and be skeptical of it. So my general take on the moment is, uh, okay, first of all, I think it's important to kind of explain, at least from my perspective, why this is happening. And I, I think that in some sense, uh, this is a perfect storm for unrest. And it's sad that it came to this, but I'm personally very proud to be a small part of it. And I'm very proud of sort of just the American people for keeping the fire up. I mean, think about what is the backdrop to this? And I'm going to come back to George Floyd and the human element that can never be forgotten. We must always say his and other names. But the fact that it's continued, uh, even after these officers were arrested, and of course, whether they'll be convicted is a, a whole other story. And the stats are not strong on this. But why is it that the debate now and the movement now is so systemic in its critique, which I think is very powerful? Well, this is all happening on the back of or amidst the COVID epidemic and quarantine, uh, a massive depression, probably the greatest since the Great Depression, an economic crash that really is symptomatic of an economy that has worked for the few uh, for many years now, at least since Reagan and, and really longer. Uh, we have these endless boomeranging wars, imperial wars that are coming home to roost. Uh, we have the tribal politics of the Trump age, which really one could say uh, since the Reagan and definitely George W. Bush age, this division of America. And we have now this uh, widespread loss of faith in the mainstream media narrative, which I think is important because thereby everyone becomes a journalist who has a camera or a pen or just eyes and uh, throw onto that kindling. And it's pretty significant killing this particularly obscene videoed murder of George Floyd, which is just uh, in many ways a straw that broke the camel's back. So I think that a lot of discussions of what's happening in the streets, and I'm not a leader of this far flung and widespread and largely organic movement, but just from a historical and analytical perspective, my position is that these factors created the moment. And they're very sad and disturbing factors, but I think that they're important and they're, they're usually not included in the mainstream narrative, which is almost always very binary, peace or violence, right? Right or wrong, what the police did, where the reality is it's more than that. So finally, you know, all of this makes me hopeful, if not optimistic, although maybe I'll go so far as to say cautiously optimistic about what comes from this. Uh, but I've, you know, anyone who follows my, social media or my articles knows that I've been, you know, in the streets uh, six out of uh, nine of the last nights in, in Kansas City, mostly and just around other cities in Kansas, but mostly in Kansas City. And, you know, I'm a small member of a, of a broad, multifaceted movement, but I think it's needed for us to be out in the streets for mainly two reasons. And that is to quote, you know, say his name, to say that enough is enough and human decency must reign and what happened to George Floyd was a, a modern day lynching, an urban lynching on a street corner, uh, just like the Eric Garner 
uh, lynching on an urban street corner over cigarettes and not a counterfeit, supposedly, right, ostensibly $20 bill. Um, that was a lynching. And that was a aggravation and a violation of human decency. And we have to say enough is enough. And the second reason I think we need to be in the streets is to expose and protest the systemic militarization of American life, not just policing, but life that created the Eric Garner's, which is what first got me in the streets in 2014, and the uh, George Floyd's six years later of the world. So, you know, that's why I think we need to be out there. And I, I feel like we're really living history right now. And uh, people say that all the time. And we all trade in peddling platitude. But uh, I saw a post on one of my lieutenant, one of my old cadets, a brilliant young uh, female student, one of my favorites. Uh, she's a lieutenant now. She's an armor officer, right? I mean, she she's living the combat arms dream, right? That women couldn't do for the longest time. And, uh, you know, she posted something or reposted something on her social media that said, like, did you ever wonder, um, you know, how you would have responded if you lived through the Holocaust or World War II or the Great Depression? And then it said, like, well, what you're doing now is what you would have done. And uh, I thought that was pretty powerful because, this is this is a this is a pivotal moment. So yeah, that's a lot, but that's all I have to say for right now on this. That's great. I I feel like it's not. I mean, as with as much stuff as Trump says every single day, every single minute of every single day. Like, I, I feel like we can't lose sight of what you mentioned: the fact that he is actively peddling conspiracy theories from fucking OAN which is clearly just the most it's like Fox News on steroids if you guys have ever seen it it's ridiculous anyways, oh yes it's like, it's insane <laughs> it's I mean the stuff that they say it's just like how can any rational person think that this is true <laughs> but regardless like so he's peddling this stuff and it's like like we can't we can't forget that like yes he's a he's a buffoon he's foolish he's ridiculous but like he's still the president of the United States and he still has millions of followers on Twitter that like hang on his every word. And it's just so annoying that, you know, mainstream media especially isn't taking him to task on specific things that he says beyond just the outragey, oh my God, can you believe he said this? And I think that that is like, a, they're doing a real, real disservice to everybody who cares about this to not push back. And I feel like it's been interesting to see like um, lately MSN, NBC and CNN, whenever Trump says something or like one of his proxies, uh, if you look at like the banner <laughs> on the, the um, screen and sometimes it'll say like really harsh things like Trump lies about blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, fuck yeah. Like they need to be doing that more every time he talks. Every time Pompeo talks or Kaylee McEnany, you know, any of the like mouthpieces for the administration, like that's the only way that people are going to get it is if we see that, if we can like, and, and the, the big organizations that, you know, make up society, I guess, uh, those, they're the ones that need to be taken care of. <sighs> absolutely. So, yeah, a a absolutely. <laughs> This is really important what you're saying. I, you know, it's where where an individual. I don't know, Kagan. I don't know if this is what you're driving at at all. But as I was listening to you, I couldn't help but think that where an individual or where an organization of any sort, any public organization, falls on this issue in this moment, has become a competence and an ethical litmus test. Mm -hmm. Are you sensing? Are you sensing that? Oh, totally. Yeah. Like we're seeing, you know, I like something that we said or that I heard a lot last night and like I've been hearing lately is just, you know, whose side are you on? And while, while I am loath to take the like binary position like that, I do think that this is a time to make a stand. You know, we have to be, we have to not be afraid of like pissing people off because that's the only way that stuff gets actually done you know, in history, like we just look at history and look at what, you know, forces things to change. It's not people being nice and, you know, saying, oh, hey, come, 
come be a part of our thing and like help us do this. I mean, yes, that's part of it, but it's also like you have to push it in their face and, and force people to acknowledge what is like what's going on. And I, I'm loving seeing a lot of my white friends, uh, you know, posting these things about like, oh, I learned this today or like I didn't think about this until now. You know, just like there's a real shift happening. And in, in our collective consciousness in America. And, and I feel like when it's moments like this, you know, we have to take a stand and we have to either say like, are we going to be with the people that are trying to have the real freedom and equality for everyone? I, and, or are we going to be with the state and with the people that are just saying, Oh, everything's fine. Don't worry about it. And I mean, like you, like you said earlier, like we're at the culmination of these three things. We've been in this war of terror for 20 fucking years almost now, which is just insane. But you know, we're like, we're really at this point where people are saying, you know, we've, well, we've been saying enough is enough for a while, but now like actually meeting it and the companies and person, important uh, structures of power are actually like, examining this in a real way that we've never seen yeah definitely uh i've made a brief career out of like arguing against you know any sort of mannequin or uh, binary uh, divisions when it comes to war but i will caveat that by saying that there are particularly rare and i think it's one of the moments in history where you do have to take sides you do have to choose and you know in the Spanish Civil War, when there was like a fascist overtaking of Spain in the 1930s, which was kind of the lead up to World War II, it was the rumblings, it was the preview. That wasn't even their own country, but where an intellectual, for example, a writer, a public intellectual fell on that issue, did in many cases determine sort of the like ethical path for the rest of their career, which is why folks like Hemingway and Orwell and, and, and lots of nameless folks from the... Uh, you know, the Abraham Lincoln brigades uh, in America or many other like expatriates went there to fight because they said no more. Enough is enough. We're not going to let fascism rise. They failed, but they ended up being sort of the vanguard of the anti-fascist movement later. And so, yeah, I think this is. And look at who the people were that were that were supporting Germany. You know, you like you look at the companies, you look at Henry Ford, you look at the people who like, uh, you know, from J.P. Morgan and from Standard and like, uh, well, they were broken up, but you know, like the, the bigger companies, like they were in support of Mussolini, of fucking Andrew Mellon. Like we can't forget that Andrew Mellon was the secretary of treasury for 11 years, used the position to enrich himself immensely. And like, he was a huge supporter of Mussolini and fascism because he saw how the state was able to make uh, economics grow for the rich. And so he was, and so he was like, oh yeah, of course, of course this is going to work. And it's just, it's so fucked, like for us looking at it now with historical perspective and seeing how terrible it was, but like, we can't forget how people were acting before we knew about Nazism and fascism, like, and, and we're in that same moment now, I think, like we're, we have people that are defending the state, they're defending these authoritarian views because it's for some reason they think that the people who are out in the streets are just there to cause trouble or whatever and not actually caring about, you know, making things better. But it's like, that's, you know, that's a narrative that's being spun. And it's the same one that has always been spun when, uh, when authoritarian regimes are in power. Yeah. Martin Luther King was very unpopular in public opinion polls when he died. Yeah. He was only, oh my God. He, was, he was only canonized later. And uh, I do think that like the positions people took publicly, what they wrote, what they said, that's like forever because it's in the Internet um, yeah. is going to come back and bite folks later. Like this is going to become that litmus test. So um, so as, as we sort of uh, transition, just because, you know, I maybe uh, I should have said it up front, like uh, what we're going to do is, you know, Henry's going to jump in now again because he's got some really interesting thoughts especially given his own experience and research on police militarization so we're going to go around the horn on on the police factor and how they've been militarized in many ways and then and then we're going to kind of transition more specifically to the actual military in america's streets which is a 
extraordinarily discomforting thing. And, and then finally, we're going to sort of go back around one last time and talk about the descent that we're starting to see in a remarkable fashion, more so than since at least the end of the Vietnam War of soldiers and veterans against the state and against the uh, orders to deploy. And, uh, and that's kind of where we're going to finish up. So, um, yeah, Henry, if you can uh, lead off with some of the, the great stuff that you know about police militarization, and we'll kick it off from there. So I wanted to talk for a minute about Washington, D.C. as a city, um, what, it, what it's like, and especially what the police situation is there for citizens of the city. Um, I'm sure uh, listeners that you've seen in the news, the unmarked um, riot squads, riot uh, teams that uh, have been utilized at times in Washington, D.C. Uh, during this uh, horrible period. Uh, I think that those, those guys were specifically from the Federal Bureau of Prisons, if anybody wants the actual answer. But the point I'm trying to make is that the president and his all of his cabinet members and other people that lead uh, LEO agencies, especially including the attorney general, they are able to pull massive, massive amounts of manpower and firepower immediately from all these different federal agencies. And if you're on vacation, if you're walking in Washington, D.C., walking past a variety of government buildings, you find out that almost every agency has its own police force. And a lot of those agencies, even ones that aren't involved in going after criminals in any way, have their own SWAT teams, like the Department of Education. I, I don't I don't fucking know why, but the Department of Education has its own SWAT team. Um, but it makes... Uh, uh, real, real quick, Henry, uh, is it safe to assume that uh, the Education Secretary Betsy DeVos's brother, Eric Prince, is probably like the CEO of that? I, I think so. I think that is <laughs> yeah. great. I'm sorry. I, I couldn't help myself. You know, the, 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 the he's the mercenary in chief. They're going to make a new cabinet position called the uh, mercenary secretary. And I think Eric Prince already has it. Sorry. <laughs> um, so the president and his and his other people, his, his cabinet, other other members of the state, other members of the government can call in these massive amount of police officers. And there's no. There's no real checks and balances on what they're used for. Um, this also includes the Joint Counter uh, Counterterrorism Task Force, which, uh, according to recent reports that I've seen, um, aside from being previously used against political dissidents or activists of, of, of different stripes, mostly leftists, um, that they're trying to use the authority of the task force to go after some activists now and uh, referring to them as terrorists. Um, so it, it's important to understand this, this citadel of Washington, D.C. in terms of, I, I, I wrote down here, I'm calling it an American police fortress because that's really what it is. Um, and this huge army of officers is exactly that. It is a literal army that the president and others can call in to be used for any given situation. Um, here's a here's a really good example of something that has changed recently. That uh, the DEA got a special exemption, a, a temporary exemption, to be able to do surveillance on protesters, which is not at all part of their mandate. But because they they're calling, you know it's an emergency that there's rioters that there's agitators, Danny, right? You know all the various synonyms for that. Um, they are able to push the panic button and bring in all these different law enforcement agencies. And it even moves out from there, from Washington, D.C. You know, the CIA has their own cops. There are, and, and I've, I've mentioned both in social media and when we spoke to Larry Wilkerson that I've already seen military police, I don't know if they're active duty or National Guard, but out there on the front lines right alongside, alongside regular cops in riot gear. And I don't think that's a good thing. I think that that is a very much a slippery slope to walking into even further layers of militarization. Um, why doesn't the DC mayor have control of the National Guard in Washington, DC? That, that, that's a question I've been asking myself a lot recently because the president was able to call it the DC National Guard and use them in whatever way he wants to with his authority. But the mayor, the actual 
sovereign leader of Washington, D.C., who makes decisions about D.C., should have that authority, but she doesn't. And um, I know that D.C., I mean, it, it's it's essentially kind of the, I wouldn't say the president's play, play place, but it's definitely the government's play place. I don't know, I wanted to mention to you guys a specific moment. There was uh, a picture of National Guard troops in riot gear standing on the steps of the Lincoln Memorial. Um, that made me really, really angry, although it, it is very prescient for our time, given the, the connections to police brutality and uh, pushing down Black Lives Matter. Now, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the weapons that are being used uh, by police against protesters. We've discussed in the past uh, different ways that, that milita- weapons of war can hurt people, even if they're not being used defensively. A good example would be the tiny concussions that a, t- a soldier can get from using a machine gun. Um, but we're going to talk about how this is affecting the, the uh, protesters. So uh, first is, uh, is tear gas. Now, tear gas, also called CS and CN, I can't remember what those designations mean at the moment, but um, it is banned as a weapon of war. In the Chemical Weapons Convention that our country signed, it is not authorized to be used as a weapon of war. However, it is given a specific special exemption to be used as a domestic riot control agent. And I put the words riot control in parentheses. Um, That term, I've seen it so many times this last week, and it's written in the way that it implies that whatever device it's attached to, if it's tear gas, if it's a a projectile launcher, pepper balls, that its only acceptable use is on riots and rioters. Therefore, it's not used at other times. So if it's getting used, then the word presumption must be that its target must be rioters. I I thought, thought that was funny and morbid. Um, I found a 2014 study conducted by the Army that determined that uh, CS gas, which is something that all new soldiers and officers get exposed to at one one time or another, um, that it does cause actual damage to the lungs, making one much more susceptible to getting upper respiratory infections, which is a major problem for basic training troops. The study itself led to a a decrease in the severity of CS gas used in basic training, trying to minimize transmission of illness and uh, minimize any damage to people's lungs. During the coronavirus epidemic, the use of CS not only becomes a concern for any individual who has to breathe it in, but an additional transmission chance for the virus. CS causes people to cough uncontrollably trying to get it out of their system, meaning that anybody who carries the virus, even if they're asymptomatic at the moment they're gassed, they would now be coughing up millions more droplets of the virus than they would have been otherwise. Then there's rubber bullets. And rubber bullets is another misnomer because they're rubber-coated bullets or riot rounds, however you want to see them. Some of them are made of wood. Some of them are made of a hard composite plastic, and some of them are made of metal. Um, One study that I found, it had documented a a total of over 1,900 injuries from rubber bullets. 15% of those injuries resulted in permanent disability. Three of them result, 3% resulted in death. Um, When the injuries were to the eyes, they overwhelmingly resulted in blindness. Um, There's been numerous reports, I think I can think of three right now, where uh, specifically reporters, but other protesters have been hit in or near their eyes and have lost their eye. I, I, I've seen that at least three times, and I'm sure there's probably more that I didn't notice uh, um, th- through the news. But the, the most important thing about the rubber bullets is to, to get around cops euphemistically referring to them as rubber bullets, which they are not. They can be different sizes. They can be shot out of uh, a 40 millimeter grenade launcher. Um, the kind that Danny and I and our troops used to carry in war zones. Um, Then we move on to flashbangs. Flashbangs are just dangerous in general. Being near a flashbang detonation for any reason is a very dangerous um, thing. I'm sure many of our listeners are familiar with that uh, little boy 
that got hurt in a raid. I want to say it was 2015 or 2016 and a flashbang went off right next to his chest and he had to have extensive surgery. I don't, I don't know what the status of his health is today, but I know that he was, he was hurt very, very badly because he was close to it. Um, you can get burns, you can get small amounts of shrapnel wounds, your vision, uh, it does, it's supposed to be temporary, but people have, uh, had long standing vision issues from it. And of course, hearing damage. There's also the chance of losing your fingers or other appendages. If the thing goes off that close to you. Um, this was something that I carried as a soldier. I carried a flashbang with me on, on patrols. Um, and I, it's very, very destructive, but it's being treated right now as a common, uh, easily used, easily needed weapon against uh, against the protesters. We come then to pepper spray. Pepper spray has a, a whole bunch of different ways to deploy it. There's the small handheld canister that most patrolmen carry. Then you get up to a, a fogger type device that is more like the shape of a fire extinguisher. Um, and the newest one that I'm still trying to learn more about is when pepper spray or a form of pepper spray is put into paintballs that can then be shot at rioters at random. Now, this this combines two different parts of this. One is the pepper spray, which is very painful, although its its effects overall are a bit diminished from CS. It, it st still can be damaging, but generally speaking, isn't as damaging. But with the pepper balls, you get pepper spray all the hell over you, and then you also get the impact injuries from the paintballs. And I used to play paintball as a kid. You get giant welts. You again could lose an eye if somebody shot you in the eye. Um, yeah, it's it, it. The the injuries can be horrific, but but it's made to seem like this is a a less is a less lethal, less damaging way to deal with a protester. Um, then we come to a little more unusual stuff like sound cannons. Um, I found a, an article talking about there's a lawsuit going on. The Supreme Court recently said that it can allow to go forward involving the use of a sound cannon in a 2014 Eric Garner protest in Staten Island. So it might be something for you to, to check out there, Danny, is in terms of the, the longevity of it, the kind of questions they're asking for the case. Um, and lastly, and, but certainly not least, is impact weapons. And with impact weapons, again, it's a, another euphemism. We're talking about batons. We're talking about collapsible batons, tasers, riot shields, um, all kinds of things that can just be used to whop the shit out of people. Um, you know, there's some, I, I, I don't want to speak to how specific departments have used their tactics because there's a lot of variants. It's all very violent, but it's... Um, you know, I, I haven't noticed anybody who's actually had any restraint yet. Here in Portland, we've been dealing with long, horrible actions against peaceful protesters. Um, Kagan, I was so happy to hear from you when we discussed this before we started that your march was, uh, your long march was peaceful. Only saw, saw one cop, which is great. Um, I'm also super jealous of the two of you being able to be out marching because I, it's, it's not something I really can do. Um, but I'm, I'm very proud that, that you guys are out there trying to, uh, to get these opinions and, 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 uh, trying to change this horrific, horrific, uh, place we are in, in America. Now, having said all that about all that different kind of gear, there are very few national regulations on riot control weapons saying when they can and can't be used. It's usually comes down to. If there is some kind of rule that comes in and says we can't use them in this specific way, it's like an appeals court decision. It's not anyone actually sat down and regulated it. Um, a good example uh, along with that would be the use the uh, the riot squad I mentioned earlier that was, I think, is part of the Bureau of Prisons. There's, I think there should be federal law that if you are a federal law enforcement officer, you your uniform has to be labeled as such at all times, and you can't take that shit off as to hide your identity when using this kind of violence. Um, yep. I think that's, uh, that's, that's all I got to say about that for the moment. That's all incredibly great stuff. And I'm so thankful that you went through the individual kind of weapons of war, right? Because that's what they are. 
These are these are these are weapons of war mm -hmm. that are utilized against the American people. The war on dissent, the war on protest, the vast vast majority of which is peaceful, right? Uh, and that's not me taking a position on peaceful versus not peaceful. I think that it we must understand the roots of the limited violence that we've seen, uh, especially in the last week where it's really calmed down. Uh, but at the same time, just on a personal level, yeah, I'm, I'm something close to a pacifist out on those streets. Uh, so while I'm not judging every aspect of uh, what's going on out there, uh, personally, yeah, I, I'm glad to see the peaceful stuff. And I was glad to hear that report from you, Kagan. Uh, and, and I've seen most of that in Kansas City. So I, I have a few comments on some of those three of those weapons. Um, I'll, when I'm anecdotal, which I will be to some extent and personal, uh, remember that I'm speaking through my narrow soda straw aperture here in mid-sized Kansas City. But Kansas City is, you know, like the largest uh, metropolitan area in like maybe a two or three hundred mile radius here in the, the middle of the Midwest, the eastern Great Plains. So let's start with like the pepper spray. Um, uh, folks to my left and right directly. Uh, were pepper sprayed on Saturday, uh, la the first Saturday, uh, and Sunday. And, uh, you know, I got some, you know, back spray, but I was pretty uh, lucky. Uh, it, it is painful. They were using the Kansas City Police when they were really rioted up, right, geared up on Saturday and Sunday of the first day of protest. They, they were definitely more uh, aggressive, and they had those kind of larger canisters that look almost like small fire extinguishers um and what i'll say is there's there's a personal side to this there's a character function here and what i mean is what i witnessed was variation among individual police officers in their willingness to use right uh the threshold at which they use things like pepper spray and so and there were a few cops that i kept an eye on and took videos of and pictures that some people have seen uh, throughout the week, but especially those first two days. Um, and those, the, all three of us and many of our listeners who've been in the military know that there's always a handful of folks in every unit that, you're, you know, they like their job a little too much. And uh, there was this one police officer in Kansas City, African-American, very muscular, uh, look the part kind of police officer, and he enjoyed his, his job a lot and he was extraordinarily aggressive and physical with always peaceful protesters in terms of what i saw on the ground and you know he was really big on uh, and he wasn't a sergeant or anything either from what i could tell uh although they're very they weren't as good about marking their uniforms with names and rank as i wish they all would have been there was very little standard that just really wouldn't have passed muster even in like a line army unit where everyone has to look the same but you know, I mean, uh, he was criminalizing space in a very arbitrary way. And so were other officers and, and some of their leaders where we'd be allowed to stand on a one, you know, curb one minute. And then like literally 90 seconds later, they'd say, no, 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 now you can't stand there anymore. We've decided it's illegal. It's, you're breaking the law. We're going to arrest you. And, you know, when a, when a woman, a very peaceful and relatively diminutive woman was uh, just like stood her ground, you know, she was pepper spray right in the eyes. And obviously I took a video of that that, you know, got some attention on Twitter. Um, there's a paradox here with any paramilitary organization or, or any organization that executes and manages force and violence. And that is, uh, to quote Kurt Vonnegut on a macro scale, Vonnegut says, uh, and he's so funny and always right, he says, there's one fatal flaw in our constitution, I'm paraphrasing, and I don't know what to do to change it. And he says, and that is that only crazy people want to be president. And of course, it's funny, right? Because it's true. Like even someone like Obama, like to think that you you should be in charge of the, like the quote free world is insane, right? Well, I, you can say the same thing about police and soldiers, right? In many ways, the only people you want, especially in like domestic community policing, the only folks that you want to do that job are folks who don't really want to do that job, right? People who don't take a lot of relish in it, and and that paradox is difficult to break. And so I saw that with individual officers, which then. Moving on to tear gas, um, that I was gassed uh, more than once and, 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 you know, and did suffer some of the, you know, discomfort uh, and side effects of that, right? You know, fluid coming out of orifices and all this. Um, I witnessed 
on Saturday evening, still daylight in particular, uh, Kansas City Police unleash tear gas on us in the park at the J.C. Nichols Fountain down by the plaza, which was where they told us we had a stay. And because some folks stayed in the street and, and sort of held their ground, their response was to, you know, tear gas the entire park that they had told us we had to stay in, criminalizing peaceful protest. They have been better since. Uh, and they've really demilitarized, which I'll get to. But, you know, this was profound. I mean, it, there is something, as I wrote, sort of paradigm shifting and changing, altering the way you look at your government when you watch strangers frantically helping other strangers pick up their multiple children to run from tear gas because there were still kids in the crowd. Um, you talked about the effects of tear gas and how it's used on, you know, CS is used on soldiers in basic training. Of course, you know, the first time that I'd been exposed to CS was in, you know, the gas chamber at cadet basic training in July, late July of 2001. And uh, this is my privilege talking as a, a white man and a veteran. I truly, even a year ago, would have thought it unlikely that I would be tear gassed by my own government. But of course, now we are through the looking glass. And, and that's something that happened to me. And I, know, I didn't ever, I haven't thrown so much as thrown an empty water bottle, right? So, but yet, uh, and, and I either had the people next to me by and large, but yeah, we were gassed. Um, finally, on the rubber bullets, uh, have not been hit with a rubber bullet, thankfully. Uh, folks were on a limited, admittedly limited basis in Kansas City. Uh, much more in other cities. It's correct to note that rubber bullet is a euphemism for real bullets, steel bullets that are just encased in rubber. When I think of rubber bullets, based on my own sort of like historical interests and then like my family, which was like vaguely supportive of Irish independence and the Irish Republican Army, and I was kind of raised on that and watched all those movies and read all those books, as, even as a kid, I always associated rubber bullets with like Northern Ireland. Right. Of course, they're used elsewhere. They're widely used in Kashmir, which is the largest military domestic occupation in the world. There's half a million Indian troops there. Right. Uh, maintaining Indian control against the population doesn't want to be part of India. But the idea of it being used widely in American streets is disturbing. And maybe it shouldn't have been because it has been used in the past. But I think through a lot of our privilege, those of us who don't live in these marginalized communities of color, the idea of rubber bullets being fired willy nilly into American crowds was almost unthinkable. And now, of course, we're seeing it exposed. You know, final point on the police militarization. I was, uh, you know, I wear like my veterans for peace shirts and all that. And I, I kind of wear my colors and identify myself in solidarity. But, um, you know, because of that, I'm a relatively clean cut looking white guy in a shirt. I've had some local media approach me in these protests and, and kind of interview me on the spot. And I had an NPR reporter come up to me on uh, Tuesday night, which was a quiet, very quiet night. And um, uh, there were still riot police. That was the last night that I saw riot police in mass out in the Kansas City streets. And, and he asked me why I was there. And I talked about police militarization and he played devil's advocate immediately. And he said, um, well, why are you so upset basically about like the drones and the sniper teams above us, you know, on these buildings? Don't you want them there in case some crazy person rolls up with an AR-15, you know, and starts shooting at the crowd? And of course, I, I thought this was a little bit of hyperbole uh, and sort of obfuscation, but I, I answered it and I said, well, yes, I mean, in a broad sense, the police should protect peaceful protesters. However, you know, I think that it would be a mistake to focus just on that narrow devil's advocacy without noting that what we're really here to protest is the systemic militarization of the mandate and the culture within the police that led us to this point in the first place. And so, you know, it's really easy to say, oh, they're just bad apples or, oh, there's lots of good cops or they're actually here to protect us without mentioning what I think finally are the two main points. Number one, militarized police got us here in the first place. They created the George Floyds of the world. And number two, the thing that the NPR reporter didn't point out, and I made sure to, was hey, if someone does roll up here with an AR-15 and shoot up this crowd, make no mistake, he was almost definitely influenced by Trump's Twitter calls for the MAGA goons to come out and sort of, you know, undertake vigilante justice against peaceful protesters. So let's not let the president off the hook. Let's not let the system off the hook. And uh, yeah, Henry, thanks for bringing that all, all up. And I think police militarization is a topic we have to keep an eye on. I would add on top of what you said, just the fact that like, if anybody 
doesn't see how militarized, militarized the police have become after everything that's going on right now, they're just being willfully ignorant because everything that's going on, you know, we can say, okay, Minnesota, like that's the focal point for, you know, the beginning anyways. That's where a lot of people were like focusing their attention. But the fact that we're seeing this across multiple states, multiple cities, you know, it's not like, like Henry said, there isn't a lot of national like guidelines on how to use this. So it just shows like, th these are the tactics that are put in place that have been put in place, because they're in this bubble of, you know, police, you know, de-escalation de tactics or whatever the fuck they call it, like to make it look pretty, but it's not what it is. <laughs> and it's just frustrating that we have people that are that are you know like i was talking to my aunt about um police and she's very like on the side of them and i would she was just you know I, po I posted the npr article about do we need the police right now or do we need them at all and she was like i actually agree with a lot of this like police aren't social workers and they're not counselors you know they're designed to end the threat as quickly as possible and we're like that's the problem when you look at everything as a threat you are considering yourself to always be on the defensive, always be, you know, getting ready to like defend yourself. And that's what the fuck is that? That's not policing. That's war. And I, I love that quote in the wire. And again, this was a long time ago, but it's, it's so true now is, you know, when that commander is sitting down with his cop and he says, the thing about calling, he was talking about the drug war, but he says, the thing about calling something a war is that everybody starts to think of themselves as warriors. And I like that has never been more true than right now, because you have people that are trying to do what they are lawfully allowed to do. And then you have this other organization that doesn't really give a shit about that. Or if they do, like their tactics and policies are not showing that they give a shit. And we can go round and round and talk about bad cops versus good cops. But like you said, it's like the policies that need to change and the tactics. And, and well, beyond that, like something that we were talking about last night generally on the march was just the idea of defunding the police. Because here in Portland, literally a couple hours before the march started, the police chief, she stepped down. She hadn't been police chief very long, but she felt like she needed to do that. Which, you know, okay, that's great. That's great that she made that decision um, in place of an African-American man who seems a little more amenable. But again, like, it's not individual people. And I love that that was the first thing everybody said. It's not one person. It's not, oh, let's change the face. You know, it's the fact that, like, this system, this institution is thoroughly broken. And we need to come up with something new. And there are people who have been creating systems like this of community policing where it's your neighbor, it's the people that are actual volunteers to go and help you and help the community. And that's, I don't know, I think that's where we're going. It's going to take a while to get there because the police unions are strong. But it's nice that we are seeing this big sea change of people being like, we can do better. We can do better than the current system we have. And instead of reforming it, let's just start from scratch. I'm so glad that you brought up The Wire because like any good guilty liberal, I think The Wire <laughs> was, was the greatest uh, drama in TV history. I used that quote, Kagan, uh, as the epigraph to one of my chapters in my first book, and I wrote that <laughs> in 2014. So the point that I think you're raising is that this is, this is old. And I'm going to read briefly what you paraphrase, because I think that you're right. This is what we need to talk about. And it's culture as much as, as it is the cosmetic equipment. You know, he said to his sergeant, who was just like kind of, you know, arresting low level drug dealers and calling that a victory. He said, this drug thing, this ain't police work. I mean, I can send any fool with a badge and a gun up on them corners and jack a crew and grab some vials. But policing, I mean, you call something a war and pretty soon, everybody going to be running around acting like warriors. Why well, aren't we seeing that now? They're going to be running around on a damn crusade, storming corners, slapping on cuffs, racking up body counts. And pretty soon, 
damn near everybody on every corner is your fucking enemy. And soon the neighborhood that you're supposed to be policing, well, that's just occupied territory, which I think transitions for Henry to jump back in to the use of actual troops. Because this is occupied territory and we are seeing what I called the empire and the foreign counterinsurgencies boomeranging back home. We're on Twitter at Fortress on a Hill and also at Facebook.com at Fortress on a Hill. You can find our main blog page and our full collection of episodes at www.fortressonahill.com. iTunes, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, Patreon, Spotify. You name it, almost anywhere you listen, we're already waiting for you. And hey, we're always in the market for more Patreon supporters. Please consider becoming a patron at patreon.com. And if you're not into giving us a monthly payment, think about giving us a couple bucks on PayPal. The link is in the show notes. Skepticism is one's best armor. Never forget it. We'll see you next time. And listen to my song. I hope you'll pay attention. I will not be.